This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit like and subscribe on whatever you're listening on. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelist tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King. Our special guest here tonight for an interview, we got a 10-year NHL veteran center, played with the Nordiques, Senators, Sharks, and Maple Leafs. He is a member of the Senators' inaugural season. He was their leader in points for forwards. He was also their plus-minus leader that year for anyone who had over 45 games. <laughs> I realize he was... <laughs> Minus 20, I do realize that, but, you know, considering that team and the record and everything, that you led that team, so that, that that's... I got, that's like, a, I had a little plaque or something from it. Let's just say I didn't put it out to show it off. <laughs> it wasn't the most, most uh, proud award that I've ever won, but I was the plus-minus award winner. <laughs> there you go. So we, we, got, we got Jamie Baker here. Jamie, thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Awesome. So we're going to get into our interview here. Brian, start us out. Uh, Jamie, at the, at the collegiate level, you played for uh, St. Lawrence University. Uh, your best overall performances came in the 87-88 season when you scored 26 goals and 28 assists and held the team uh, you know, through the tournament all the way to the finals. Uh, was that, What was that season like for you, and, and what did you learn from uh, Coach Joe Marsh? Well, first, Joe Marsh was an absolute legend, uh, 26 years coaching at St. Lawrence. Um, he, he actually recruited me. He was the assistant coach um, when, uh, when he was recruiting me. And, and then his first year as a head coach was my freshman year. So kind of got lucky in that regard. And uh, he actually, uh, we just recently, I was up in Canton, New York, and an award called the Legends of Appleton, Appleton Arena. And, and he just got inducted. So it, got, it was a big weekend. So that was uh, that was about a month ago or so. Anyway, it was pretty cool. Joe, Joe Marsh is like, oh boy. He was so young when he was coaching. He was like 32 years old, but just the ultimate motivator. And he taught you life skills. And it was about being integrity, character, being a good person. And then like when it came to hockey, it was the work ethic, your compete level, all of that. Like he admitted that he wasn't the best tactical coach in the world. Like he, he fully admitted that. He's like, I want you guys to, you know, communicate if there's things that you think we can tweak here and there. But he wanted second effort all the time. That's what he did when he played as a, as a player. And, you know, he was a depth player, like a, you know, a third, fourth line forward, hard nosed forward. And that's what he, he expected that work, work ethic all the time. And we kind of came in, I, I don't want to call us cast offs. There was a lot of us, they, we weren't necessarily highly recruited from some of the bigger schools. And it just so happened that there was two, three years of really good players that came into the uh, St. Lawrence program around the same time. And we were building up to that year, to my junior year. Like our first year, I think we started off 0-7 or something, but we still made the playoffs. Like we had a good run in the second half. My second year, we were better. We made it to the ECAC finals, but lost, I think, to Harvard. Third year was when we really took off. I think we were 29-9 and nine that year, and all nine losses were by one goal. So we were in every single game. And for all the teams that I played on, I've always told people that was the, and you don't know it at the time, how good a potential team can be. Um, we were an interesting team. The best teams usually dictate the pace of the play, whether it's defensive, wide open, whatever type of game. Like that's what good teams really do. We were kind of a little bit different. We, we could play a wide open game or we could play a real like hard nose grinding, grinding type of game. We had a really good defensive core, underrated defensive core. Um, we had some prolific scores, really good goaltending. We had a really good power play. I think our power play percentage was over 30%. So we kind of like let the other teams dictate how they wanted to play. And we would go along and play it and typically beat them. And that was, you just don't see that very often, you know. So uh, I think as the year went on, we realized how good we were and you know, we, we took our foot off a gas, a gas pedal a few times and it cost us a couple of games during the regular season. But come, playoff to, come playoffs, we were uh, 
we were a beast in the playoffs. And I know we went to the final four. It's the last year they ever did it. Um, Maine, Maine played uh, Lake Superior State on a Thursday night. It was in Lake Placid, so it was really close to St. Lawrence. We were playing on the big rink. Uh, Maine played Lake Placid, or Maine played Lake State Thursday night. We played Minnesota Friday night. The championship was Saturday night. A little bit of an unfair advantage for the team that played on Thursday night. Well, an advantage. I shouldn't say a little bit. Like, they had an advantage just, just emotionally. Like, we ended up beating Minnesota that game, and it was – we scored with 13 seconds left. Pete Lappin had a hat trick that game. He scored all three goals. The emotions of winning the semifinal game and then trying to fall asleep, and then you got to get up and it's another game day versus a team that had a full day off. Um, was it a factor? I mean, we outplayed Lake State in that game. Bruce Hoffert, their goalie, stole the game. They ended up winning in overtime, but we didn't have a very good start in that game. And part of the reason is I don't think, you know, we were still just emotionally drained a little bit from the win the night before. So it took us a little bit to settle into that game, but. Um, amazing season, amazing team. Um, we've lost three players from that team have passed away, two of them in 9-11. So there's a, a, a different bond, even like we had a strong bond as a team anyway, because of the success we had. We won the ECACs, lost the NCAA championship in overtime, but even a more special bond because three players have uh, passed away since then. So it's, it was a unique team, a unique group. And, uh, something special, something you carry the rest of your life. So you make your way to the NHL, you go to the Quebec Nordiques. When you come in, there's young future stars there, Joe Sackick, Matt Sundin, Owen Nolan, Adam Foote, just to name a few. So what was your experience like with the Nordiques organization? And the second part of that question is, is were you surprised that they left Quebec? Did you, did, did you see that coming while you were there? The, the second part's easy. Um, you, we didn't really know, and it wasn't something you focused on. So, like, I love my time in Quebec. I wish I spoke, I best, I, I, you know, I wish I was fluent, you know, and bilingual. I wish I could speak French. I didn't. I was okay at it. I understood a little bit of it, but not as much as I would have liked um, for living in the city. But you just, we didn't get caught up in all of that stuff. And that happened after I left. So they were still there for another year after I left. So um, never got caught up in that. Um, they had a good fan base there and, you know, didn't get into the politics of that. So how, my time there was, was interesting. Like you talk about all the young players. So they were in a rebuild mode, but like I went to my first training camp and Peter Stastny was there. Michelle Goulet was there. Joe Sackett was there. Like, these are some great players. I played with Guy Lafleur while I was in Quebec. I, I just remember watching uh, Peter Stastny and how good he was. And even seeing Joe Sackick as a young Joe Sackick. This is in training camp. And realizing, like, I was still – I was a two-way player in college. Like, I was conscientious in all three zones. But I was still knowing, you know, the last year or two of my college career – um, you know, I scored a lot. I was on the top power play, things like that. And I knew my first training camp that I was going to have to change my game. Like, I'm like, I can practice. I, and I was 22, 23 years old going to my first training camp, you know, because I went, I went to college after high school and then four years of college. So I was an you know, older rookie uh, from a pro standpoint. And the emphasis was going to have to be like a real, like a checking type of player, more physical than I played in college. Um, definitely a checking role, a penalty killer, block shots, like one of those guys, the third or fourth line guys. And I went to Halifax, got sent down to the minors. Halifax had a great coach in Robbie Fatorek. And he, he taught me so much. And I was willing to learn. I was a real student of the game. We used to play three on three after practice. Just and he, a lot of times he 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 would play, and you would just learn these little tricks. He'd do stuff for you, and you know he, just little things that he'd learned over the years. So I learned so much even just post practice from him. I remember we would do during practice five on five in the D zone, and he would stop like when he blew the whistle. He you stopped like if your stick was in the air, 
he didn't want you to put it on the ice like he was fixing things so he would move your feet like six eight inches like 10 degrees this way and he'd explain why you got to be between the guy and the net but you got to be able to support down low just in case there's a breakdown here's why you want to have your stick here it influences them you know away from the slot area so all these little innuendos that you learn and then you you start to utilize them in game situations um that's what was happening with my time in quebec so i i never thought like probably my junior year in college i had a really good year i thought maybe i can have a pro career maybe luckily i could make the nhl but my first year of pro is where i started to like figure out the pro game and a lot of it had to do with robbie fatork and then the other thing he did with me i was a left-handed centerman played center my whole life i played wing a few times here and there growing up, never liked it, didn't feel like I was engaged enough. And he came up to me and he goes, Bakes, do you want a one in four chance of making a team or a one in 12 chance? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, it's really simple. Yeah. Do you want a one in four chance or a one in 12 chance? And I'm like, well, a one in 12 chance, that's my odds are better. And he goes, well, I'm gonna teach you to play wing. So he started playing me wing and Lo and behold, I got called up my first year. I only played one game my first year with the Nordiques. Um, but the, my first game, I was playing right wing with Joe Sackick and Michelle Goulet. So two Hall of Famers. I was nervous. I was the anchor bringing the line down, and I realized that. But still a cool experience. Um, and it was playing wing that first got me into the NHL, and then I eventually moved into a center role once I was with the Nordiques my second year. So the next chapter for you, uh, you were with the Senators for their, just yeah. their inaugural season, 1992-1993. What were things like that first year in Ottawa? And did you ever consider uh, re-signing with them? So I wasn't considered. They... There was a big, they changed the roster over. So they weren't going to bring me back, even though I'd had a good year. So there was a bit of politics involved with that. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think they wanted to have me back. It, it, even if that San Jose was offering me, was giving me a better offer. So, and a good, like a, a better opportunity. Um, how was it in Ottawa? It was a mixed emotions. I'm playing in my hometown, which ne growing up never had an NHL team, and now they do. The coolest thing ever to be a part of that. Like that first game, um, that that home opener against Montreal, we ended up winning the game. Still one of my top five hockey highlights in my life. Just playing the inaugural game in Ottawa. By the way, yesterday here in Ottawa, December 6th, was the 32nd anniversary of when Ottawa got awarded the NHL franchise. So right. kind of a big deal. They, the media always brings it up. So um, I was actually doing the Sens broadcast. I do a bit of the pre and post game on the Sens broadcast. I do like 20, 25 of their games on TSN 1200 radio. And we were talking about it on the show last night. So that's why I know that. So it was 32 years ago yesterday. So the home opener was cool. Um, playing in my hometown was cool. It gave me an opportunity because it was an expansion team. Um, it gave me an opportunity to get ice time that I might not get elsewhere being on the first or second line and power play time. So I think that year, I don't know, I think I had 19 goals, but I think 10 of them were power play or something like that. So, you know, I was getting ice time that I, for a third or fourth liner, I was getting first or second line ice time. Not all year, but for some of the year. So it what it did, my time in Ottawa allowed me to kind of establish myself as an NHL player. So I was breaking in while I was in Quebec. I played three years in Quebec, my first year in their organization. First year, I played one game for the Nordiques. Second year, 17 games. Third year, I started in the minors and then played the rest. Like I was in the minors for a month, month and a half. I had a knee injury. And I think I played like nine games in the minors and then played like 56 or something like that for Quebec. So, but, but really kind of established myself as an NHLer in Ottawa and like as an everyday NHLer. The flip side of it was the losing. Even though you're in the NHL and it's the best league in the world and you made it, 
and your family's proud of you, your friends are proud of you, it's cool. You don't get that far being accustomed to losing. And we were losing a lot. So I think we only won 10 games out here, 10 or 11 games. So it was, it was a long, long season. Um, the losing wears on you. Like we didn't win on the road until near the end of the year. We, like we almost went the entire season without a win on the road. So um, good group of guys. We knew we weren't. We knew there were going to be a lot of changes after the first year. Um, but you kind of stick together. You band together. And there was no expectations in Ottawa. So it's not like the fan base or the media were mad. You know, they were just so happy having a team. Like they were they were excited when Pittsburgh came in. They got to see Mary Lemieux. When LA came in, they got to see Wayne Gretzky. You know, when Montreal came in, they got to see Patrick Waugh. And, you know, like, so th there were no expectations. But within the dress room, it was, it was a long year because nobody's accustomed to that kind of losing. But still a, a cool memory to be part of the inaugural team here in Ottawa because it's my hometown. I, I was wondering, too, I mean, you had 48 points, a very s solid, respectable number that year in Ottawa. Um, and you were right, you guys, you won 10, you tied four. Um, I was going to ask you about the expectations, but you kind of got on that. But um, so let, let me ask you this. Brad Marsh was his final season in the NHL, if I'm remembering correctly. So what was it like to get to then uh, there at the end of his career? So Laurie, Laurie Boschman was the captain. He was the captain. Um, Marshy was one of the assistants. Um, another leader on the team, Doug Smale, near the end, of, you know, he was at near the end of his career. Uh, Brad Marsh, just watching him, not the most – not the best skater out there, but just the work ethic he put in every single game, um, the way he would go down and block shots and pay the price. Like you get to see, and even Laurie Boschman, the way he played the game, he, he was nasty, like the nicest guy off the ice. He was so mean, like he, he had over 2000 penalty minutes, you know? So you watch these veterans and you see how they prepare, um, you know, day in, day out, their practice habits, you know, some of the little, things that they do in games, how they pay the price in games, how they try and remain positive even in tough times. So, you know, it's it's that type of leadership that you kind of learn from. Um, both great guys, Doug Smale, great guy, but loved playing with Marchie. He was kind of an instant legend here. Whenever he got one of the stars, he would sprint out there, like, and, you know, like wave to the crowd, like he'd sprint. Like usually guys just kind of stroll out and give a wave. He'd do a full sprint out there and kind of stop at the blue line and fans loved it. And uh, he was he was instantly a fan favorite here, didn't play with a helmet. So it was right. it was cool playing with him. But again, also hard because we weren't winning a lot. But, uh, you know, when you get to play with, Guys that you've been watching, you know, in high school, I'm watching these guys in the NHL. Now you, they're on; they're actually on your team. Pretty cool experience. Yeah. Well, let's move ahead to whenever you guys were winning. Uh, 1994, Game 7 of the Western Conference uh, quarterfinal, Sharks versus Red Wings. Uh, the experts had you guys getting swept or maybe winning a game or something, but you were able to nail the game-winning, series-winning goal uh, how did that play unfold, and and what was the feeling like, you know, just defeating such a heavy favorite? So going into that series, we were a number eight seed, uh, first time, third year in Sharks history, third season in Sharks history, first time making the playoffs, kind of ahead of schedule. Um, it still to this day is the biggest regular season turnaround in NHL history from their second year to the third year, like 56 points or something. It's going to be really hard to beat because you have to be horrendous one year <laughs> to have a 56-point improvement. Like, you can't just – you know what I mean? Like, that's like a team going from 50 points to 106 points. Like, you got to be – to get 50 points is really hard to do. So, it'll be a tough – you know, it'll be – and especially the way they do the expansion draft now, like the team – the ex, kind of Ottawa – situation they were so bad their first year that this second goal when Vegas came around Seattle like the league changed the expansion rules because they didn't want them to be as bad as Ottawa was and and Vegas took advantage of it but that was part of the reason is they looked back at previous expansion teams you know um and and made rules accordingly but 
the, the thing about that San Jose team, we started the year like 08 and two or something. And we were kind of like that St. Lawrence team I was talking about. There was a whole bunch of cast-offs, Bob Airy, Todd Ellick, um, you know, I know Sean Cronin came over, Jeff Norton came from the Islanders. We, they had a Larry Onoff, Makarov, Ulf Dolan came over. So all this, it was just this Hodge, Ray Whitney, Ray Whitney, Pat Falloon, they were drafted by the team. But this hodgepodge of guys that, and this new coach, Kevin Constantine, and we got off to a really bad start. So we were kind of playing for our playoff lives from the beginning of the year, like game 10 on, you know, and we played a really structured defensive style. We were in a lot of close games and. And we stretch. Detroit was this freewheeling, wide open team that could score a lot of goals. They got Fedorov, Iserman, you know, they had Konstantinov, Lidstrom, all kinds of guys. Dino Cicerelli, Primo, like really, really high powered offensive team that blew a lot of teams out. Who, and I could be mistaken, but I think. The Sharks, in, because of our struggles in the first part of the year, I think back then we played 84 games. I think in the second half of the year, I think we might have had like the fifth best record or points percentage. Like it was impressive. That's, that's how we got into the playoffs. So while we were an eight seed, we weren't playing like an eight seed coming down the stretch. So nobody, nobody really took that into account. Like we went – we went on a nine-game unbeaten streak at one point. We went like 7-0-2. So, um, which you you got to be playing some good hockey. So we were playing – so we went into that series. Nobody nobody believed in us. Deep down, did I think we were going to win? In a best of seven, I'm like, I doubt we win, but you never know what can happen if we can steal a game or two here. We had Archer Zerby. Urbe playing Nats, who was great, except at handling the puck, but he was phenomenal. And our goal in that series was keep the games close heading into the third period, whether it be tied or a one-goal game either way. That put us in our comfort zone. And if you look at the series, we won all the close games. They won the blowout games. Like, I think we lost 7 nothing in game six, but we won the one-goal game in game seven. And that, that goal, like, it's a huge goal, one of the biggest goals in Sharks history. Like, Ray Whitney was just coming through. They turned the puck over with seven minutes left in a tie game in the third period. They turned the puck over at our blue line. Ray Whitney gets the puck, dumps it in, jumps by their 2D. Osgood comes out to play it. Todd Ellick, the centerman, changes. I jump on the ice. So I'm on the same side that Osgood throws the puck up. He's feeling the pressure. And uh, there was a Detroit player behind me. I forget who it was. He he didn't cover me properly. And the puck just came up. And honestly, it was the hockey gods. Um, right time, right place, lucky bounce. Osgood fired the puck up off the glass. It came off the glass and it landed flat right in front of me. And I just one-timed it far side. I knew Bob Airy was somewhere over there. Um, I was just trying to get it. It was like an abbreviated, an abbreviated uh, shot just to get it towards next. I knew somebody was right behind me. I didn't want him to ba basically hook my stick before, if I took a big windup. And it ended up being the game-winning goal. So it was, there was some luck to it in the sense of puck luck, the way the puck that came to me. But if you look at the other facets of that goal, it was mistakes by, they were, they were doing what we'd hoped that they would do. Keep making like turnovers at the blue line because they didn't like to dump and chase. They liked to play, that little more like offensive, wide open game, carry the puck in, puck control, puck possession type of game. And they ultimately paid for it in the end um, on that sequence. And then we, we held on. Like we literally held on for the last six and a half minutes of that game. And it was a huge upset. And obviously it was, it was huge for the Bay Area for, for the team to win. You know, it got a lot of people into hockey in the Bay Area because that was the year, the first two years San Jose played up at the Cal Palace, which is close to San Francisco. It's in South San Francisco. Um, that third year we played in San Jose. That was the first time that San Jose had a pro sports team. 
Everything else had either been San Francisco or Oakland in the Bay Area. And so it was a momentous occasion, if you will, uh, for the organization. So with San Jose, you spent a large chunk of your hockey career there. You, you end up leaving, but then you go back for your, your final year, and then you eventually you end up working commentary for them as well. So I just, what did it mean to you to, to get a chance to go back to San Jose that last season? Was that something you were trying to do, or did it just work out that way for your career? As a player? So yeah, you mean as a player? player yeah. yeah. So I was just looking for something, and um, – I'd played, I'd been in the minors part of the year before. So Toronto had sent me down. And I actually was with the uh, Chicago Wolves of the International Hockey League, which is now defunct. It ended up merging with the AHL. But at the time, it was a rival league to the AHL. It was like an older version. The American Hockey League had younger rosters. The IHL had some older rosters. So I was on the Chicago Wolves. We ended up winning the Turner Cup that year, which was awesome. Um, great group of guys. Just looking for anything that summer, I got invited. I signed a contract, but Daryl Sutter was the coach. And to be fair, like his brother, Ron Sutter, was the fourth line center. So Dean Lombardi, the GM, Doug Wilson, head of hockey ops, they wanted, you know, they knew me as a player. Um, you know, I was a fan favorite there. I think they wanted to bring me in. So they gave me the opportunity. Daryl Sutter, he just didn't want me on the team. So, and he's the one that's putting the guys on the ice. So I, I didn't play many exhibition games. I went over to Japan to start the year. Um, Jeff Friesen, Owen Nolan were holdouts for camp. So it opened up a spot. But there were seven centers over in Japan. We opened the season two games, a two-game set against Calgary. And the Jared Scaldi, myself, and Ron Sutter were, um, were like vying for the last spots at center. We were all left-handed centermen. And they had me on the fifth line as a right winger. So, and at that point in my career, I was, I was a centerman. I wasn't playing wing like I was at the, you know, breaking into the NHL. So I kind of knew my, my days were numbered. So they ended up, it was an interesting contract that they could get out of at early December. So I had like, without getting into numbers, it was, it, it had an out clause for them if it didn't work out. Cause I didn't necessarily want to play in the minors so again. It was too much moving around with my family. So we set up something where I was guaranteed a certain amount of money but I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna be going up, back and forth, up and down. I'd done that the previous two years, and I was done with that. So I only played. I think I only played one game that year. So I was around the team for about a month or so, and that was it. And then I retired. Uh, came out of retirement, went over and played in Finland um, for like three, four months. I played with the Helsinki Big Red Cats IFK over there for a little bit, which was basically a cool experience. You're getting paid to go play in Europe. Um, we, my family came over after I was there a month training, getting in shape. Um, and then my family came, but our kids were really young, uh, um, which was part of, you know, we did it as a, it was also a lifestyle decision. Let's do this. Doesn't happen very often. Went over, did some travel around Europe and that after, after the season was over. So that was a cool experience. Brian finishes out. All right. So, Jamie, I, I watched your segment. Uh, on heads on the headstrong series um, gave a very transparent view of some of the mental health challenges uh, that you face uh, in your daily routine to yeah, as you put it retrain your brain um, I know that there are many folks out there who struggle with something similar uh, if any of our views are struggling what what message would you give them um, seek help be open about it talk to loved ones people that really care about it um, you're not alone. That's the biggest thing. So, and whatever it is, you know, it's, it's, and it's easier said than done because if you're in a dark place, um, it does, it is, it's lonely when you're there and you don't know necessarily who, how, or what is going to help you. And sometimes you don't even want help because you get into a really dark place. And I've been in that place too. So the, the number one thing is to seek help. <clears throat> Getting into a good routine is easy to say, like train your brain and, and exercise and nutrition. And I do gratitude journals and different things like that. But 
yourself out of the black hole of depression before you get into, you know, changing any habits or a routine or whatnot. So, um, you know, after that whole headstrong, I had another bout of it during COVID. Came, I moved back to Ottawa. I've been, I've been diagnosed with bipolar. So I have a doctor. I'm on meds. If, if you need medications, I take them morning and night. My doctors told me I'll probably take it the rest of my life. I'm fine with that because it's, it helps me stay away from manic or depressive behavior um, or episodes, I guess, manic, manic ep depressive episodes. Um, whatever it takes, if, if, if it's getting a psychologist, talking to a therapist, if it's a psychiatrist, if it's meds, like you have to work on it because everybody's different. That's where the brain is. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, breaking your collarbone or breaking a bone where, you know, okay, here's the diagnosis. Here's what we're going to do to heal it. It's going to take this amount of time. Then you're going to be better. It's not like that. Um, it's, it's different for everybody, every set of circumstances. And that's, you know, even more, more important why sharing it, talking about it, being open about it, and then, you know, finding the right help, however you can, however you can, um, not everybody has the resources for it. So, um, which makes it, which makes it difficult, but trying to be open about it. Um, and then other people, well, most people say they're going to be compassionate and empathetic to your situation. Good stuff. Well, I want to thank you, Jamie Baker, for coming on and talking with us. We appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Love awesome. the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Have a great day. Thank you. I want to remind everybody, too, hit that like and subscribe button. We want to thank everyone for watching. We'll see you all next time. Have a great night.